Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Orange Coast Community Church. It is a glorious morning. Amen. Amen. Where would you rather be than in the house of the Lord this morning? You know, before we get started, I'd like for you to just take a quick look down on your phones, make sure that they're off, if they're on vibrate or stun. Today, we are here in God's house, and it's all about praise. The songs are about praise. So let's get our hearts prepared for today. Heavenly Father, we are here in your house right now. You woke every one of us up. You breathed your breath of life into us today, Lord. And so we're here. We're going to praise your holy name as one, as your children come to you this morning. We're going to praise you in the good times. We're going to praise you in the difficult times that we have. We're going to praise you in the happy times. We're going to praise you when we need healing and our bodies are hurting. We're going to praise you when we start new things. We start new jobs and we start new relationships, Lord. It's all about you. So Holy Spirit, come now. You're welcome here. May God's house be filled with our praises this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Come on.
are alive. Jesus, you are alive. Amen.
He is Lord of all. Amen. Amen. We get the wonderful opportunity now to give back just a little bit of what the Lord has given to us. Keep in mind that the things that we do now, you can text it to that number there. You can put it in the agape box back there. You can leave it, slip it under the door. Any way that you can get it here, know this for sure. Your money, your offering touches lives in this town, in this community, and across the world. So we want to thank you. So take a moment, take this time between you and your maker and figure out what's the best offering that you can bring today. Heavenly Father, we pray for this offering today. We pray that it will be abundant to meet all the needs of this church and touch lives as we continue to touch lives around this planet. For Orange Coast Community Church has always been faithful givers. Yes. And we have changed lives. And we have saved lives. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to do so, no matter where we are, no matter where you take us. We are your church. We are your people. We are your children. Mm -hmm. We ask that you be glorified in our offering today. We thank you, Father, for providing for us so that we have this opportunity to give back just a little bit to you. Mm. We know we can never outgive you. So we ask you to multiply our offering today. Mm. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, family.
Good morning, beloved. Good morning. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along this morning, we will be reading um, the scriptures from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. And Pastor Dave will be reading from John chapter 4, verses 48 to 54. I'll be starting with Mark 1. Crowds healed. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she was waiting on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all that were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he had healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Yeah. Just a quick, if you, it's 46 through 50. Same Gospel of John, chapter 4, 46 through 50. Amen. And he came, therefore, again from Cana of Galilee, where he had made water wine. And there was a certain royal official whose, name, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was requesting him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus therefore said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he started off. For several weeks, we had mentioned that we were about to start a brand new series, and we gave you an opportunity to see if you could read my mind and guess the passages that I would be speaking from. And I want to thank about six or seven of you who made an effort to do so. And it was difficult because how, how in the world are you going to be able to choose a few passages when there are so many in the Gospels? But uh, there were three people who did very well, and so I'm going to call them up, uh, beginning with the third place uh, winner. Uh, she guessed four out of the 12, and that's Darlene Zamorano. So she's in there. Well, you want to come up and pick it up for her? Here you go. You give that to Grandma, okay? The second place, guessing eight out of the 14, is Kathy Schultz. Good job, Kathy. And the first place is my bride, guessing nine. Just edging out Kathy. I think this happened last time you guys were so close. So congratulations. And I know it took a lot of time and hard work, especially for both of you. They were calling me constantly, what about this, what about that? They were trying to get hints. I refused to give them hints. But uh, they did very, very well. 
And so you'll be discovering in the weeks to come what exactly the passages are. You've seen two of them today. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the joy we have of uh, entering into your word, having fun in our study, and uh, just having a great time because the Bible is meant to give us tremendous joy. Oh, yes, there's conviction, there's challenge, uh, ultimately there's change, but there's also happiness as well. And so help us to get a feel for that happiness and joy as we step into this brand new series today, The Incredible Compassion of Christ. Speak to our hearts, lift our spirits. For those who are struggling and hurting, give them great strength today. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. amen. It was a June day in the year 2018 when 12 boys made a decision that nearly cost them their lives. They descended into the recesses of the Tham Luang Cave in the nation of Thailand, and the plan was very simple, and that is poke around for about an hour, emerge with some great memories, and then cycle their way back home. But no one expected the water. A sudden storm flash flooded the passageways, trapping the group of boys inside. They had no food, no light, complete darkness, and zero communication with the outside world. You talk about terrified irretrievably trapped. The boys had no way of knowing it, but uh, around the world there were people praying for them. God heard the people's prayers. A network of nations developed an incredible rescue operation. Get this, for 12 boys, there were an effort of more than 10,000 people involved. Divers, rescue workers, soldiers, helicopter pilots, ambulance drivers, as well as diving cylinders, sniffer dogs, drones, and even robots. They all came together in an attempt to reach out for the 12 boys that they did not know. It took the workers nine days, but the divers eventually found the boys huddled together on a muddy ledge. The rescuer removed his mask, told the boys, I'm just the first, more are on the way. Could you imagine how they felt at that moment? Yes. Help has arrived. And that's the theme of where we're going today. Help is coming for those who are struggling. And at some painful point in the future, every single person under the sound of my voice today is going to feel like they're stuck on a muddy ledge of life. You're going to be in a precarious position in which there's absolutely no escape, physically, financially, or emotionally, in a dark cave. But when you cry out like these people cried out to our loving Lord, he will step in and send his Redeemer to rescue you and to infuse you with happiness and hope in the future. Well, this was certainly true when Christ came to this troubled planet 21 centuries ago. The gospel accounts picture our perfect Savior as being chuck full of compassion. The famous Russian novelist Dostoevsky said, compassion is the chief law of human existence. Nothing defines our humanity more than compassion. And since Jesus was, as we know, the perfect human being. He had perfect compassion. He had it in spades, so much so that those who were engaged in this study of trying to discover what passages I'd be preaching from became frustrated because they said, Pastor, there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So much of what Jesus did was based on compassion, and that is incredibly true. When Jesus saw the leper, Mark 141, moved with compassion, he touched him. When Jesus saw the hungry multitude, Mark 8, 2, he felt compassion and he fed them. And when he saw the widow's son who had died in Luke 7, 13, he felt compassion for that lady and he healed the son. His heart reaches out to those who are struggling, those who are hurting, those who are helpless, those who feel like they're stuck 
on a muddy ledge. And like he was there for them, he's also here for you today. He wants to reach out and touch you and minister in some meaningful way. But you're going to have to let him do it in his way. And it just may be that some of you have been going through struggle for a long time because you have wanted God to heal you or touch you in the way that you've designed, the way that you've desired. And one of the lessons we're going to learn in this series, particularly today in our second point, is that God always does things his way. And so you must start with absolute surrender. If you have any expectations, he may not meet that need. You have to come to him hurting and helpless without any suggestions and then watch the Holy One step in. Now, today we're going to look at two accounts of his incredible compassion in the passages that our elders read for you today. The first one is recorded in the second gospel, the first chapter. And here's what we see in Mark, point one in your outline, Jesus helps those in need. Mark chapter 1 and verse 29. Immediately after they came out of the synagogue. So that's kind of the historical setting. The synagogue is where Jesus had just taught them the Holy Scriptures, verse 21. The synagogue is where Jesus tossed out a hideous satanic spirit of a miserable man in verse 25. So he's done some ministry within the church. Now he's going to do it outside the walls of the church. And that's letter A in your outline. Jesus cures diseases. He cures diseases. Verses 29 and 30. They came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. There is a church today that teaches ministers must remain single. They point to Peter and say he is the Pope. He never got married. There's only a problem with that. Jesus has a mother-in-law. Hello! Where does that nonsense come from? Not the Bible. To have a mother-in-law, you must be anyone married. Just common sense. We're told in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, his wife accompanied him on preaching tours. So there are two passages of scripture that go against this concept of ministers not being married. Now, Peter's wife's mother is sick with a fever. It's the Greek word pereso for fever from which we get purify and it means fire. She's aflame with a fever. Look at verse 30. And immediately, they spoke to Jesus about her. That was very wise. The cards are stacked against her. There's nothing that medical science could do at this point. But the four disciples believe that Jesus could perform a miracle in spite of the odds. I like that. I'd call that optimistic faith. And we're going to see today, if you want God to work, you must have optimistic faith positive faith. On a summer day, a man stopped by a baseball field to watch a little league game. And he pulled one of the little players aside who was sitting in the dugout and he said, uh, what's the score? The boy smiled and said, we're behind 18 to nothing. <laughs> he said, I must say, you're not very discouraged. He said, why should we be discouraged? Our team hasn't come to bat yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's optimism. Just wait till I come to the plate. Just wait till Jesus steps up. He's going to swing and man, will he hit a homer. Woo! It's going to be so good. Verse 31. He came to her, raised her up, taking her by the hand. Now, you're going to read this and the other gospel accounts. And please keep in mind that when you read the similar story in different gospels, you're just getting it from a slightly different perspective. This is fascinating when it comes to inspiration. When God inspired men to write the scripture, he did not do it in a robotic fashion. He didn't say, take that personality that I gave you and throw it in the trash. You just do what I tell you. He never did that. He allowed people to work within their framework, within their personality, and he guided them. Now, in Matthew's account, 
It simply says Jesus touched her. In Luke's account, it says he stood over her. Why would Luke say that? Because he looked at it from a doctor's perspective. He saw it through the eyes of a physician. Now, Peter sees it from exuberance. And never forget, whenever you're writing or reading the Gospel of Mark, you're reading Peter. Peter's the one who dictated these words to Mark. So you could feel the exuberance as he's saying, you put this down, Mark. He reached in and he grabbed her and he lifted her up. Just like Peter, that's why it's stated that way. The emotions are throbbing within him as he remembers his mother-in-law being healed. And then what happened? Well, the fever left her. Flushed cheeks, burning skin, dry throat, profuse sweating, interspersed with violent shaking, gone, vanished. She's healed. And then what happens at the end of the verse? She waited on them, which meant she fed them. Now, if you've been sick intensely, it takes you a while to regain strength. 100% cure instantaneously. She's up. She's at the food. Jesus, how about some hot, deep dish apple pie with a big scoop of ice cream? That sounds good. I don't know what she gave them, but they all ate and had a great time. Moments before she was in misery, now she's perfect. Verse 32. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill. When evening came. There's no mistake in writing that down from Mark's perspective or from Peter's. According to the Jewish reckoning, there were two evenings. There was 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. It was after the second evening when the Sabbath ended. Only then, at this early time in Christ's ministry, did the average person have the guts to go to God's Son. Because the nation was ruled by controllers. Just like our nations were ruled by controllers for a year in 2020. It's a hideous place to be. To be under the thumb of someone who thinks they know better than you when the facts aren't even in. And the facts were not that it's wrong to be healed on the Sabbath. But they didn't care about the facts. The Pharisees had their rules. They had their structure, they had their order, they had their design. And everyone knew it was wrong to be healed and to do anything on the Sabbath. And the Mishnah, which is not the Bible, it's just chock full of Jewish traditions. In the Mishnah, it says it is a sin for a woman to gaze into a reflection or a mirror on the Shabbat because she may see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out and that would be work. Now, you laugh at that, but when we began this country, we had legalistic Pharisees alive again. We have Pharisees alive in every home and every church. They're the rule keepers. They rise to the top and tell you to do something that they have no planning on doing in their own lives. The Code of Connecticut was in vogue in the early years of this country's existence obviously established in the state of Connecticut. And here's what it said. No one shall run on the Sabbath day or walk in his garden. Now let me share with you the stupidity of that statement. Sabbath. How has the church translated the Sabbath over its years? We call it Sunday. Sunday has never been the Sabbath. So right off the bat, they're off. They're not talking about Saturday. They're talking about Sunday. So they're wrong right at that. It's a sin to walk in the garden? Oh, yes. You cannot travel on Sunday, cook on Sunday, make beds on Sunday, sweep the house on Sunday, cut your hair, or shave on Sunday. If a man and his wife kiss each other on the Lord's day, they will be punished by the magistrates. So the way it was is the way it became when this country began. And there are churches today, as I speak to you, that have rules very similar to that. 
Now, we discovered in 2018, when we did that series, when Jesus broke the rules, he enjoys shattering standards. Jesus likes breaking stupid rules. When it comes to holy laws and standards that God has set up, he wants us to keep them. But there's already enough standards. We don't have to add more to that. And because Jesus spent three years confronting religious controllers, that's how he got stuck in a place called Calvary. It was all planned, designed. Jesus always goes against religious controllers. So child of God, if there's someone in your home, if there's someone in this church who is telling you what to do and it's not in scripture, tell them, I love you, take a hike. That's straight from your pastor. Some of you have standards about the way things should be. You ask yourself this question. Is my standard biblical? Do I have enough scripture to support it? If it's not, listen carefully, shut up. Because the instant you speak out to someone else and tell them what to do, and you can't find it in the Bible, you are now a Pharisee. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is going to be against you. And you're not going to get his blessings just like they didn't get the blessings. But here's what's interesting. Who got the blessings? The simple folk. The struggling folk. The hurting folk. The people who needed help. He was always there for them. These are the things I love about my Jesus. I think he's wonderful. Verse 33. Whole city had gathered at the door. You know why? They mobbed Peter's house because Tiberius was 10 miles away from Capernaum. Tiberius was the center of a famous spa that had, they thought, curative powers in the water. And so the sick were flocking to Tiberius. And then when they all of a sudden hear about a great miracle worker 10 miles away, they get out of the water and they start dripping wet, walking all the way to meet Jesus. And it sounds good, but it's not so good because they're just coming to God's Son for what they can get out of God's Son. Oh, I hope you don't come to church on Sunday for what you get out of it. You come first to glorify God. Amen. Secondly, to inspire others. And then you don't have to worry about getting something out of it. You will. Amen. You will. But so many people come to God just for what they could get from God. One minister said, many people love God the way a peasant loves his cow. For the butter and the cheese he provides. Gimme, gimme. And I can't count how many people I have ministered to over the years here at Orange Coast. When everything falls apart in their life, they're in my office. They're here on a Sunday morning. And that's great. I'm glad God uses that. Their child is sick or their finances are down or their car is broken or something bad is going on. And so they rush in to get something from God. And then when God heals the child and the problem is taken care of and calling them, they don't answer the phone. You never see him again. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times I've seen this in 31 years. Gimme, gimme. Lest you think that's a good attitude, I want you to remember in Luke 10, 15, Jesus pronounces a curse on this city because people came to see what they could get from God. But they did not come to worship God. So Jesus said, I gave you all the information. I gave you all the miraculous activity. I healed you. You didn't walk with me. There will be a curse on Capernaum. And it's going to happen, he says, in the future, in the judgment day. Verse 34. He healed many who were ill with various diseases. Please don't throw, be thrown by the word many. It doesn't mean that he healed 
many but not most, or many but not all. This is what happens in typical, quote, healing services today when people go to healers in tents or in shows and, and, and there are some who get healed and then there are dozens who, are, who still have the walker, who still have the wheelchair, who are still coughing, still ill, still hurting. Well, we can't heal everyone. Really, Jesus did. Many does not mean many. Many means multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes because we are told clearly in Matthew's account of this, Matthew 8, 16, Jesus healed all who were sick. So if you're wondering if a person's a healer today, if they can't heal them all, they're giving you psychosomatic healing. If you're wondering if a person's a prophet today, you tell them to prophesy something that's going to take place in the near future. If they're a liar and they don't come through, the Old Testament said, you stone them to death. So we need to be very careful when it comes to these so-called great sign gifts. God could give them. God uses these things. But we like to attribute giftedness to people who may be involved in psychosomatic activity and not truly spiritual activity. Jesus healed everyone. No one was excluded according to the teachings of Scripture. In this ancient city, he cures diseases. In this ancient city, letter B, he casts out demons. Verse 34a. He healed many who were ill with various diseases, and there it is, he cast out many demons. And how about that interesting statement? He's not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. They get great, perfect testimony, but he said, that's bad press. <laughs> I don't want the throngs of hell announcing to people about heaven. That's not smart. You know what I find fascinating? When I read the Old Testament, I, I see very few um, people being demon-possessed. When I read the epistles, I read almost nothing about demon possession. A little bit in Acts, but not in the epistles. Very little. But when Jesus shows up in the scene, Satan shows up in the scene. Demons surrounded Christ. We're told in the book of Revelation that right before Christ comes to set up his kingdom, he is going to allow Satan to unleash hordes of demons from the pit to dominate the lives of people. And it's my personal view that as we're getting closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, we should expect more and more demonic activity. Yes. Yes. Obvious activity and sometimes subtle activity. Satan will be alive and well, more at work today than ever before because he shows up when the Savior shows up. That's just the way he works. Now, first he says, silence, the demons are not going to testify to me. But then also, also it's interesting to note that he recognizes demons as intelligent personalities, distinct from the people that they possess. A believer who is a psychologist named Adam Bly describes a demonic encounter he had with a woman seeking his help. She explained that she had a reoccurring experience while drifting off to sleep. She slept on a mattress on the floor and would suddenly find herself half asleep and stuck and unable to move. The form of a person pulling themselves along the floor with their hands would approach her. It would come up and whisper in her ear for a long time. She could not quite remember what it said. So she asked me to hypnotize her in an attempt to recover the memory of its words. She lay down on the bed. I sat in a nearby chair, and with her consent, the session was recorded by a video. I got halfway through the induction, and something strange happened. A raspy male voice snidely said, What do you think you're doing? We're in charge here. She's ours. Get out of here. I tried to speak to the lady, addressing her by name. She could not respond. The male voice started laughing. You don't know what you're doing. 
We're going to have fun with you tonight. You know, for the next two hours, the voices alternated between what sounded like a woman and the raspy male voice and several other male voices completely distinct, not from the lady, before these demons were cast out. There's been a few opportunities I've had as a minister to come face to face with Satan. I know what he sounds like. I know how he acts. Because I've heard him speak through people that I really, really thought I knew. But when they voiced themselves through this personage, I thought, that's not that person at all. And the hair in the back of my neck was standing up. And it was scary. But I confronted it and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave. One person, a demonic voice driven by Satan to destroy a church I was in, put his arm around me, and I almost broke it. I said, Satan, don't you touch me. I'm a minister of God. Walk with God long enough and close enough. You're going to have similar experiences. Satan will show up. This is going to happen more and more as we get closer to Christ's coming. First John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You're going to shake and quake a little bit, but you're going to get this incredible power from God. And you're going to see it and you're going to face it, and you're going to address it, because that's exactly what Jesus did. Never do it in your own power. It's always in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus always won when it came to the devil, and he always will. So Jesus helps those in need. The second act of his incredible compassion is this. Jesus heals a nobleman's son. The fourth chapter of the fourth gospel. Let's turn there. John chapter 4. The first movement of healing a noble man's son is letter A, and that is the love of a father. Check out a father's love in verses 46 and 47. Jesus came again to Canaan of Galilee, the place where he'd made the water wine in John 2. There was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. The father's a royal official a man of influence and prominence, a man of wealth, a man of authority and privilege. It's possible he was a, a member of Herod Antipas's great family. Even if he wasn't, the guy had lots of authority, lots of power, and all the money he needed to survive in life. He's conducting business in Canaan when he discovers that Jesus has suddenly returned from Judea. And so he goes up to the Messiah now, the man's home is in Capernaum. That was the place we were at in Mark chapter 1. It's an important town on the north side of Galilee. It's about 18 miles away. Now, keep this in mind. The distance from Capernaum to where this man is at is 18 miles. That is a six-hour trip by foot. But if you're rich like the nobleman, it's a two-hour trip by a chariot. Remember this, it would only take him two hours to get home. That'll come into play in a few moments. His son is so sick, he's at the point of death. So he runs to Jesus and he pleads with them. The reason why is because he's a dad. Someone wrote, you know you're a dad when you suddenly know all the words to every eagle song. <laughs> You know you're a dad when you change your car's oil exactly at 3,000 miles. 
You know you're a dad when mowing the lawn is no longer a chore. You see, it's a privilege. And you know you're a dad when you can actually tell old John Wayne movies apart. <laughs> but there's a greater sign. You know you're a dad when your son or daughter is ill and you do anything, right, to aid them. Anything at all. And this man who is wealthy, who has, who has importance and influence, basically falls at the feet of Jesus and he's pleading with him. The word imploring is, a, is an imperfect verb in the Greek language which speaks of a continual action. Jesus, you've got to heal him. I mean, you have to do something. I mean, he is sick, he is dying, you just got to heal him. I'm just begging you through, I'm pleading with you, please heal my son. That's the thought in the original language. It doesn't talk, he pleads, he is passionate. But he is also revealing some of his weak theology. You got to come down to my town to do it. What's the implication? He didn't think that the power of Christ could travel over 18 miles. He's heard the stories of what Jesus did. He, he has to walk up to a person. He has to see them. He has to speak to them. He has to touch them. He just can't speak a word to do it. So in essence, he's telling Christ how to do things. Here's a principle worth jotting down. You ready? Oh, I guess it's not on there. Back up. I meant to put it there. True trust allows Christ to operate in whatever way he chooses. Say that with me. True trust allows Christ to operate in whatever way he chooses. Let's say that today or the next day or the following day, you are in the miracle or the market for a miracle. When you're at that place, do not dictate the method or the means to the Savior. Don't tell him, this is my expectation. We're in the market for a miracle at Orange Coast. We still don't know where we're going to be in the next six months. I have my thoughts. You have your thoughts. Every single person I've talked to has their thoughts. It's okay to have our thoughts. When we talk to the Father about it, we don't tell him our thoughts. We say we need a place. Show us where. Make it clear. He will do that. He will do it soon. We don't dictate the method or the means. We allow the master to create his own miracle. The nobleman will learn this very soon. Now here's what's interesting, and I like this about Jesus. There's so many things I love about Jesus. The more I read the Gospels, the more I study him, I've been doing this for 58 years, the more I fall in love with him. The man comes, just like other people came, and said, Jesus, could you help me? He's pleading, isn't he? He's not only humbling himself, he's humiliating himself, right? He's in the dirt. Essentially, and you think that Jesus would say, okay. Watch our Lord's interesting reply in verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Whoa, Jesus, where did that come from? That's no way to speak to a person who's asking for help. Oh, but it's Jesus. Maybe you have a concept. I think that seven and a half billion people on this planet have a concept of who Christ is. We have a lot of woke churches today that think they have a concept of who Jesus is, but it's way off base because it's not biblical. And there are people in evangelical churches that are not woke, that are straight, that are walking with God, that have concepts of who Christ is that are also wrong as well. And what we learned in our series five years ago when Jesus broke the rules is that he likes to shatter human concepts of how he chooses to work. The moment you think you have Jesus in a box, he will laugh and break out of it. He does it frequently, and he's doing it right here. Divinity disarms 
humanity. Say that with me. Divinity disarms humanity. So if you're going to get close to Jesus, get ready to be disarmed. Verse 48. Lest you people see those signs and wonders, you won't believe. Do you feel the frustration? If you can't, you're not reading it right. He is highly frustrated. That tells me something about my master. Everything Jesus says teaches me who God is. And I'm going to tell you today what really bugs God. Really bugs him. We, not, we know it right from this text. There are millions, if not billions today, who are bugging God because they have this philosophy. You've heard it. Seeing is believing. He hates that philosophy. He won't work with that philosophy. You prove it to me. Then I'll put my faith in you. And Jesus said you're going to be waiting for a long time for that one. Because now you're dictating to me the terms. And the moment I dictate anything to God, I lose it. I must come empty-handed, on my knees, with a humble heart, with a repentant heart, with the heart as we did in this sanctuary months ago that was broken as we prayed and we fasted. You show us, Lord. That's what he's looking for. Back in the early 1970s when Calvary Chapel was just getting its roots, there was a, a group that sang a song that we would sing quite often. Let me give you the, the lyrics to the chorus. If you will believe, then you will receive and feel. The gift of love and, and love from above is real. Faith comes first. Turn to the person next to you and say that. Faith comes first. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is not difficult. It's impossible to please God. That's what he's asking for you in this message today and for me. To start living a life of pure faith without evidence. But the declaration of Christ, which is, Unless you people see signs you won't believe, still does not detour the desperate, passionate cry of this father. And Jesus is impressed. Jesus does this in his healings. He puts roadblocks in front of people. They have to cry over the roadblock or climb underneath and knock it aside. He's testing their faith. And it may be you haven't received from God what you like because he puts a roadblock. You go, okay, quit. I just quit on that one. We're told in chapter 7, you've got to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Those are present imperative words in the Greek, which means you can't stop. You've got to keep going to him. I've been praying for this church every single solitary day, sometimes five to ten times a day since we've discovered the news. We're not sure we're going to be. Because God tells me, you keep talking, you keep talking, you keep talking. Don't tell me what or how, just keep talking to me. He loves that. And this guy will not give up. Jesus likes that about him. Verse 49. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. I don't care what you're saying about belief, just do something. I need a healing. Amen. And so... The love of a father leads to the Lord's favor. Isn't that nice? The Lord's favor. Verse 50, the first words. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. That's the compassion of Christ. He has a heart for you if you're hurting today. He won't say no to a desperate need. But notice, oh, notice. Jesus says it his way, not the nobleman's way. He's not going to do things your way. If you were God, he would. But you're not. He does it his way. He just says, uh, get out of here. 
That's what go means. Get out of here. He's healed. He just speaks the word. What's Jesus doing? He is testing the man's faith based on the statement he just made in verse 48. Essentially, he is saying, by go, will you believe if you can't see? Anyone know the answer? Yes, I will. And so that brings us to the third movement, and here it is. The Lord's favor leads to the living faith. Not the dying faith, as so many have today, but the living faith, the faith that goes on and on. Look at the end of verse 50. The man what? Believe. Believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off as he was going down. This is interesting now. His slaves met him saying that his son was living. He inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. They said to him, underscore, underline, highlight it, yesterday. At the seventh hour, the fever left him. Yesterday. I thought you're pleading with Christ. I thought you're imploring with Christ. I thought you're saying, Jesus has to heal my son. I thought you told him he's at the point of death. And then Jesus says he's better. Why don't you just rush down and check it out? He didn't. He could have been there in two hours in the same day. When Jesus said, go, your son is fine. He said, okay, I'm going about my business. And he conducted his business in Canaan. That's living faith. Amen. That's trusting God. That's not putting him to the test. That's not setting your standard. That's not saying, if you tell me, I'll believe it. And about 24 hours later, he shows up and discovers his son is healed. Just like Jesus said. You know, the master still performs healings today. And in many credible ways, he, he steps in and, and touches the lives of other people. And on Wednesday night, I was uh, talking with uh, one of our elders, Renee, and he shared with me a story of a healing that occurred with his son. So, like, Renee, if you come up at this time and uh, briefly share it with the congregation, what happened with your youngest son? Wow. <laughs> About, I would say, three... Three years ago, my son was in an accident. I'm sitting at home, wife's at work, and I get a knock on the door, and there's two police officers, and they asked for my wife. I was like, what did she do? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> And they just, oh, nothing, nothing. Uh, you know, we got a call from Westminster Pol uh, Police Department it's asking for you or, you know, be, uh, yeah. Alex's mom, that's who they were asking. He didn't mention me. He had, you know, her as a contact. So they said, after I told him I was the father, they said, they're requesting your presence at UCI Hospital, your son, you know was in an accident. And I said, well, what is it? We don't know. Mm. We were just sad, you know, to come here and let you know that your presence is requested there. And first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, I'm going to go identify a body, right? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, but I was calm. My spirit was calm about it. I didn't jump out of my shoes or anything like that. So I called my wife at work and I said, just, you know, I had a couple of police officers and this and this and that. She can't pick me up. She seemed fine, but I could see, you know, a little worriness in her, which mothers would, you know, they don't hide that stuff. Mm. We hide it better. Yeah. But so we get to the hospital emergency they sent us there this kid comes out and i asked him and he goes oh yeah yeah we found out yeah who this kid was blah 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 and i said okay uh where is he is he okay he goes yeah yeah he came at it's a doa wow. <laughs> wow. i was like um doa well 
Yeah, yeah, you know, when a person comes in and they don't have an ID, blah, 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 the computer kicks out a name for them. Okay. <laughs> and I just look at this kid and, and I said, are you referring like to a John Doe or something like that? He goes, yeah, yeah, you know, and I said, <laughs> I said, do you know the difference between DOA? <laughs> you know, now I start explaining to him these things and he's like, poor kid went pale. <laughs> he didn't know. You know, and he goes in there, brings the lady out, nurse. She said, he's fine. He's downstairs. You know, his femur was just completely, you know, so they had, they put a rod in there. And, you know, there's some bleeding going on, but we don't know exactly, about, you know. So we don't see him for a week or whatever, the COVID time. He comes home. And he tells me the story that the doctors didn't release him uh, a little sooner because they said there's a uh, uh, some kind of laceration in his spleen, mm. and it's we can't stop the bleeding. Yeah. And if we don't get in there, you might bleed to death, right? But if we open you up now, it might go to your brain, yeah. aneurysm for the rest of your life, yeah. or die. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're gone either way kind of thing. That's right. So that he goes, give us some time. The doctors, meeting other doctors, trying to figure out what to do. So they come, do a little more tests. They leave. Doctor comes back and asked my son, are you religious? And my son goes, yeah, I, I believe in God. He goes, well, whoever you pray to, you better start thanking them because your liver is no longer bleeding. Oh. It healed itself, <laughs> and we have no, we don't know why. Oh. But you think, you know, so you want to talk about, you know, <laughs> praising him in the storm. Yes. You know, we're driving down and go identify our body. A kid tells me, confirms that he's yes. DOA. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, we walk out of there praising him That's in the so storm. Good. <laughs> I love it. I love your body. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Love your body. He's a God who still heals today. His compassion could compel him at any point to step in and do something just like that. Look how it impacts this man, verse 53. The father knew it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed as well as his whole household. In verse 50, we had temporal belief for a sickness, and now in this verse, we have eternal belief for salvation. So we could say, in essence, the whole family comes to Christ and their lives are changed. Which leads us to, and that is the lasting lesson. Let's say it together. The Redeemer is impressed with faith that does not require proof. He knew it was in the heart of this man. Jesus knew that when he said, go, your son lives, he would walk and not go down to the town and check it out. This is what God's looking for you and me every single day of our lives. He'll ask us to do something, and he wants us to trust him. When it comes to being in church every Sunday, not making excuses, not saying why I can't be there, you be here because it says in Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourself. When you're not here, you're forsaking it. It's sin. God talks to me about giving. He talks to me about reading. He talks to me about witnessing. He talks to me about holiness. He talks to me about many different topics. And when he speaks, he wants me to exercise faith. And to step out, and to be bold, and to trust him. Jesus is frustrated with folks in the first century. He is frustrated with people in the 21st century who are always in the search for a sign. You see them, they go from church to church to church, from healer to healer, from movement to movement. Thousands of people happening over there. Woo, that's where I'm going. 
because that's where the hoopla is at. We've seen so many people over the years, not just me, but all the pastor friends that I have, people I've known for over 25 years, who go through the same things that Orange Coast goes. They leave the little church. Not because there's not love there, not because there's not good teaching there, not because they're not cared for there, but because it's not enough hoopla. <laughs> Happens all the time. Hoopla. The crowds flocked from Tiberias because the hoopla is here. And Jesus said, I'll give you hoopla. I'm cursing you for that attitude. You don't need a sign. I wish that God would give me a sign exactly where he wants us to be. He hasn't given me a sign. He says, here's what I want. Rick, I want you to have faith that does not require proof. I don't even need to see. I need to trust him. Here's a line that we are all to live by. It's very simple. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith. Not by sight. The father of faith, as he's called in the fourth chapter of Romans, is Abraham. Why is he the father of faith? Because Hebrews 11, 8 says, he went out at the age of 75, not knowing where he's going. Sarah goes, where are we going? He goes, I don't know. God, where are we going? God said, I'll tell you when we get there. That's faith. He will not require any less from you or from me. We don't have to see. That's the Impala. The best high jumper in the world. From one stance, he could go 10 feet high. Best broad jumper in the world. It can leap 30 feet in length. God has placed within the DNA of the Impala these unique capabilities so it could survive during the wilderness times in which it's stuck. But here's what's interesting. You will find Impalas in city zoos kept within an enclosure of a three-foot tall wall. How could a wall three feet tall contain an animal of this athletic ability? Oh, it's very simple. The impala will not leap unless it could see where it's going to land. Does that sound familiar? We're always wanting to have evidence. We're always wanting to lessen our faith and have more facts before us. We want to know the outcome of a situation before we get there. The life of faith does not work that way. I could prove that to you from Genesis all the way to Revelation. 66 books of the Bible teach this over and over and over again. Joshua goes, how are we going to take down the city? Here's my plan. We got the soldiers. God goes, no, just start walking. I'll tell you what to do. What do we do now? Let out a whooping wail of delight. And watch the walls come tumbling down. Moses says, God, how are we going to get through the Red Sea? He goes, just lift your hand. And declare your faith in me. David, at the age of 16, already had that. He knew that a tiny stone could take down a nine-foot, four-inch giant. Because he knew that God could do anything. Do you know that God could do anything? Are you living your life by that basis? Here's a homework assignment for you and for me. This week, the Lord will nudge you. He's going to nudge you now to make a statement, to take a step outside your three-foot comfortable enclosure. He's going to ask you to replace worry with assurance of his holy word. 
You'll know when he speaks because it's not you. You would never have thought of it. And when he does, take a leap. And don't look at where you're going to land. Trust him completely. Let's bow together. Did you know that the first step for entering the family of faith is a leap? You have to trust God's plan for getting to heaven and not yours. Your plan is I'm good enough and God's going to weigh my good deeds against the bad. And if there's enough good, that's not God's plan. God says, trust me, you'll never be good enough. Trust me, your imperfections have put a major roadblock between earth and heaven, and it's one that you cannot climb around or over. They have prevented you from eternally entering paradise. But I sent my son as the solution. He will rescue you when you're stuck on the muddy ledge of life. But you must say, I trust you to get me out of the darkness that I'm in. Now, first of all, if you're not a Christian today and you want to release your life to Christ completely and to trust him from this day on, it would be my privilege and honor to pray with you a short prayer that would assist you in stepping into his kingdom. If that is your desire right now, would you raise your right hand good and high and I would pray for you. You never before accepted Christ, but you want to do that now. You're a Christian but you've been living by sight and you've been wanting the facts and the evidence and life isn't working out the way you want it to. But starting today, you're going to take the leaps that the Lord is asking you to take. And you'd like me to pray that you'll have the strength to remember to do that when the opportunity arises this week. And you could raise your hand good and high, and I'll pray for you today. Father, so many people looking like half the congregation have lifted their hands because they've been touched by your holy word. And they have seen that it's only by faith can we operate our lives. So I'm lifting all of their needs up before you. You know the specific situations. You know what they're wrestling with. And you want to infuse them with supernatural faith, which is the beginning of a miracle for their life. And the start of experiencing not just regular, but incredible compassion that's going to guide them for the rest of their days. So each moment, in fact, those who raise their hands, I believe, before next Sunday arrives, will have an opportunity to test this prayer and to test their faith. For them and for me, when you say leap, help us just to do it. Help us not to worry about where we're going to land. And when we, we secure the landing, we'll be so happy. We will discover, oh, it does pay to trust Jesus. This will be our prayer. Guide us all in our journey over these next seven days. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said... Amen. 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 It's possible that you want to be baptized as a sign of your faith. We have about five or six people so far who are going to follow the Lord in baptism. We're going to be down at Pirate's Cove on the first Sunday of the month of August, August the 6th. So if you have not yet been baptized, be sure to talk to me. We'd love to discuss that with you. And it would be a wonderful event in your life. Let's stand together with the worship team as they come up at this time.
we have our marching orders for this week. <laughs> so be a good saint. Be a good servant. And reach out. Look for those opportunities. Listen. Step out in faith. Yes, we will, Lord. May you be glorified. 